you can't be the hero of your own story. If you want that story to be memorable, if you want that story to resonate with your client, you can't be the hero of the story. They have to be the hero. Episode 93. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week, I'm once again connecting with my friends across the pond in the US, and I'm speaking with the brilliant Jeff Eccles. So Jeff is on a mission to change the way that architects do business by helping us communicate with more empathy and not so much ego so that our clients and employees are able to see value and not just experience architecture and our businesses and our services as a commodity. He's the president and chief strategy officer of Echo Engagement and he's also the host of the brilliant Build Your Brand podcast, which is one of the podcasts under the umbrella of the Entree Architect. So Jeff works with architecture and engineering firms, specifically helping them with their branding, their communication, their leadership, marketing, and business development strategies. And this was a a fantastic conversation uh, that I had with Jeff, and he goes into a lot of depth about brand and how important it is for architecture practices to be building their brand and what brand actually is and what it means and how powerful it can be in growing your business. So sit back, relax and enjoy Jeff Eccles. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work. But it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Jeff, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Um, You're the host of Build Your Brand, the Entree Architect uh, podcast, um, and you're also a professional speaker and founder of Echo Engagement, um, a a business consultant. You work with a lot of architects, engineers, uh, people in the construction industry to help build their brands and their businesses. So really great to have you here. Where are you exactly? You're in Chicago, near Chicago, Indianapolis. Right. Right. Yeah. Th- thanks, Ryan. It's it's good to be here. I am in Indianapolis, which is, if you're not familiar with um, all the maybe minor geography of the United States, we're a little bit south of uh, Chicago, sort of between Chicago and Detroit. Cool. And you're in, you're enjoying lockdown as much as you can, I guess. <laughs> I, I guess. Yeah. Everything start to blend together, and and uh, um, you know we're we're doing what we can. Great. So we were going to talk today about well your 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 new podcast and really this idea of brand and why it's important to architects and I guess the first question to start off with is what is brand? Yeah, that's that's a good question. It's a good starting point. Um, you know, when we when we were talking about launching this podcast um, and, and talking about brand and, and the idea of brand. And, and, and I say it in the very first episode of, of the podcast is that I know that some architects that turn the podcast on and listen, will say, well, you know, I don't have a brand or, or maybe the last, do I need a brand? Um, and, and the answer to that is, well, whether you like it or not, you have a brand. Mm. And there's this quote from Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, that I like to use all the time. You know, I probably reference it about 10 times a week. And what Bezos said was, your brand 
is what other people say about you when you're not in the room. So, you know, if we take that idea, you know, just kind of sit back for a minute and go, okay, well, what are other people saying about my firm? Mm. And maybe, maybe, especially in today's day and age with what we're experiencing now, um, maybe even ask who's talking about my firm. So it's important to understand that not only are your clients, but your employees talk about your firm, right? And so for any architect that thinks, well, I don't need a brand or I don't have a brand, my argument is, well, yes, you do have a brand. Um, and not only do you have a brand in the traditional sense that most people think about as, as, as a uh, corporate or a business brand, but you also have an employer brand. You know, before a few weeks ago, when this COVID nineteen crisis started to really boil over across the across the globe, yeah, many studies showed that lack of available talent and um, recruiting and re- retaining talent was the biggest concern of most firm leaders across the globe. And so, if we were having this discussion maybe a month ago. I would have really leaned on that employer brand side of things because, you know, that, that was, that was sort of the the thing of the day, but um, no matter what time we're in, no matter what's going on, there's, there's both sides of that equation. And it, and it all comes back to that quote. It's what other people are saying about you when you're not in the room. That That's really interesting that you've distinguished there actually that there's a, uh, an, an external conversation about your firm and also the internal conversation. So the brand actually has an impact internally on your business operations, on your team, how they perceive, how they perceive the organization which they're, they're working in as well. Right, right. And, it's, and what's amazing is, you know, when, when we set out to launch this podcast and, and we decided to, to highlight a, um, a world-class brand, you know, some of the best brands in the world. Mm. And when we started to look at different brands and, you know, you've got to decide, we've picked one for each season. And so in season one, we're using Southwest Airlines, but but you've got to, you know, you create your short list and you have to decide who that's going to be. But But as we started looking at different brands, what becomes obvious very quickly is that the best brands in the world, whether it's Southwest Airlines or, or Nike or Apple or whoever, um, all of those best brands have a couple of things in common. Number one, they have a purpose, a guiding purpose. And that guiding purpose is the thing that ties everything together. It's the thing that they turn to when they have to answer a hard question or make a hard decision or when the people in their organization um, are empowered to do things and say things and make decisions, it all comes back to that purpose. Um, and then that purpose that, you know, the second common thread is that that purpose leads to what most people would look at and say, well, that's a pretty unique corporate culture. Mm. So that brand on the inside and the outside, they're, they're both, they're both informing each other and they're both based on that common purpose, this, this driving and and guiding everything. So how does a, a company define their purpose? So that purpose is the sort of the generator of all of your brand, both internal, external. And when you say purpose, what do you, what does that mean? Well, I think so. So I think there's some mythology around that idea, you know, this idea that, oh, here, here's this purpose that we have. Um, and, and this is our guiding purpose. And, and this, and this is, it starts with this and, and then um, it grows from there. And, and in, in some respects, that's true. But if we look at Southwest Airlines, mm. uh, which is, again, that's the brand that we feature in, in season one of the, of the podcast, the, 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 the lore of Southwest Airlines, the origin story of Southwest Airlines is that these two guys were sitting in a barn in, in San Antonio and they drew a triangle on a napkin. And, and basically the conversation was, listen, Texas is a really big state, 
right? And it takes a long time to drive from, um, say, San Antonio to Houston or, or some of the major cities where people, where business people would have to, you know, I've got a meeting here, but maybe my next meeting is in Dallas and it takes three or four hours or more to drive to Dallas. And so the conversation was really about, wouldn't it be great if there was a way to get from here to here to here and home in a day? And so that, you know, the, the origin story of Southwest Airlines starts there. Now, the purpose of Southwest Airlines that they'll, they'll refer back to to this day is mm. giving people the freedom to fly. Right. That purpose wasn't fully developed, wasn't fully realized for several years into into the business. So they, you know, they had an idea and that, that purpose speaks directly back to that triangle on the napkin. So it was something that evolved out of that. It was something that had to evolve out of over time. And it was something that they, they had to kind of realize and get their heads wrapped around. And the same is true. You know, I, I don't, I don't care what the brand is. The same is true for all of them. Yes, they, they have a purpose, that purpose was not 100% clearly defined and, and worked out on day one, right? right? It's something that we evolve into. But having said that, once, once again, back to Southwest, once we know, okay, well, yeah, our, our purpose is giving people the freedom to fly. Now that guides absolutely everything we do. In, in a, in a, and I mean that in a very literal way they're they're relentless in their focus on that that purpose and it's interesting so the the first season is that just just dedicated to episodes about southwest airlines so you're right, you're, right. you're so you're breaking down a different aspect of how the brand has been developed and right. matured and evolved over time Right. In season one, we, we use Southwest Airlines. There's 12 episodes. And so we, we walk through from origin story all the way through, um, re really looking at the, the life and growth and, and pivots and, and difficulties um, and, and successes, obviously, um, that, that Southwest has experienced over the years from, from their start in 1967 to, to today. And, and the purpose for doing that was... Um, we really wanted to take a brand and pull it apart um, and dissect it and look for opportunities where architects can learn, you know, look outside the profession. Yeah. Um, there, there's so much, so much time spent looking inside the profession, uh, but look at a big successful brand, an airline that has been profitable for every year, since they started flying, the only one, by the way, but has been profitable since the very first uh, year that they started flying. How many architecture firms can say that, right? So, yeah. so we really wanted to be able to take one brand and do a deep dive and look for lessons that architects can find in that one brand. And then next season, we'll pick another brand and we'll do it again. Amazing. So why, why was it important for you to look to study a brand outside of the architecture profession. Well, I, th I think I, I think number one, most of us that went to architecture school didn't get much business training, right? Maybe you had a pro practice class or, or a pro practice series or something like that, but you didn't learn a whole lot about the business of architecture. It's it's what's fantastic is we're having this conversation under, under the moniker of, of business of architecture UK. Um, there's, there's this idea that architecture is buildings and architecture is design and architecture is, is creating wonderful environments um, in, in our places where we live and, and where we worship and where we work and things like that. But mm. um you know, a lot of people, when they ask me about my background, um, I'll say that other people hijacked my career. You know, they kind of tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, you're pretty good at this. Why don't you come do this? And, and what they were doing was cracking the door open and exposing to me the, the fact that there is this 
business of architecture. Um, there's, there's, if we don't have a business, we can't do architecture, right? Yeah. We can't practice our art. So, um, so the reason that I think it's so important to look outside the profession is that number one, we're, we're not trained in this, which means that young people coming up, you know, maybe recent graduates or associates or new partners, most of those people have been trained by people within the profession who also had no training, right? And, and so it's all this, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of inward focus, a lot of insular training. And we prove year after year, except when the economy is roaring along, we prove year after year that we don't really do it that well, right? There's mm. a lot of failure. Um, there's, there's a lot of, of pain. There's a lot of suffering. And so why not look outside the profession? I think it's really important to look at other business models, um, other, other industries, other professions and say, not how do we replicate what they're doing, but how can we learn? How can we take best practices? How can we, architects are creative problem solvers. Yeah. How can we look at what Southwest Airlines does and take some seed and plant it and, and learn from that and, and apply that to my business model. Mm. Could you give us a, a few tasters of that, of, of how Southwest or some of the lessons that we can learn from like a, a successful brand like Southwest? Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, n- number one, obviously is, is the idea of purpose. If, um, if you're, if your firm doesn't have a driving purpose, then you really need to kind of take a step back. And right now would be a, a fantastic time to do that, right? Mm. It's why do we do what we do? Um, now, that's, that's a really deep question. It takes a lot of soul searching and, and, and looking at um, the people that we serve and the people that we help. But, but identifying that purpose and really drilling down and using that allowing that to be our guiding purpose. That, that's rule number one. You, you've got to be able to do that. I think the second thing is, and, and this is also a, another misconception, there are a lot of people, um, probably in 2020, there will be, um, or maybe before COVID-19, there would have been two or three major firms across the world that were going to go through a rebrand or something like that. And a lot of times what happens in that rebrand is they, uh, a firm, you know, a branding firm or, or somebody will come in and we'll start looking at the culture and we'll, we'll start uh, looking at all the brand artifacts. That's also a misnomer. You know, we don't, our brand is not our logo. That's right. a brand artifact. Um, that's, um, you know, our colors and our, our tagline and all those things. Those are brand artifacts. That's not our brand. But many times, especially in this modern era, a lot of people go, well, let's, you know, let's focus this brand on our culture. And that's fine. You know, we talked at the the beginning about employer brand and corporate brand or, or, or company brand, business brand. But what's important to understand is if, if, again, if you look at Southwest Airlines, their brand is based on their customer. Right. And there's an, as I was studying, I've, I've been studying Southwest Airlines for a long time now, uh, you know, to, to do the research and, and find everything we needed to find for this, this podcast. And I, I found this, this one story in this one quote where they were, they were talking about this new feature that they were going to add. They were talking about this, this uh, um, this, this campaign that they were going to launch, and and they were having trouble getting their heads wrapped around how to get it right, and mm. and how to make it really meaningful, and and how to make it really answer back to to uh, their guiding purpose. And there's a quote somewhere where someone says, "Well, I was having this conversation with a with a." Uh, uh, a customer with a, uh, one of their, you know, someone that was flying on their airline and they said, you know, I just asked him what was really important. 
And that was sort of like an epiphany. And that was a moment of pivot Mm. for the entire leadership team. And I think that's important for every architect to understand is that you can build your brand on your, on your corporate culture, on your firm culture. But if it doesn't mean anything to your client, to your ideal client, then it's worthless, right? It all, it all needs to speak to and answer to and be guided by what's important to your client. Yeah. Now, do you want a, a, a good workplace and a safe workplace and a good culture and all that? Absolutely. But if it doesn't matter to your clients, then there's this disconnect that's going to, that's going to cause a problem, that's going to tear these things apart. Do you often find with architects that there is sometimes this conflict, if you like, between um, the way that we're communicating, not necessarily being client centric, but kind of more either focused to communicating to other architects or it's about us, you know, and I, and I get that as well. Like there's, there's an artistic expression in this, you know, you kind of really want to, you want to show your identity. You want to, and sometimes a lot of architects, that is the most important thing. And also how we're perceived by other, by other, the rest of the profession is also incredibly important and the client often gets sidelined. Right. Right. Yeah. That's there. There's a concept that I talk about in the podcast that I also use in, in my work that I call ego versus empathy. Right. And it's based on neuroscience. And just on on real basic terms, you know, your brain is in your head. My brain is in my head. Rule number one to keep us alive. (laughs) Right. And, And so there's, you know, we see everything through this lens that says, how do I survive? And then beyond that, how do I thrive? Um, which really makes us fundamentally self centered. Yeah. Um, and the, in the interesting tie into Southwest airlines or, or any airline is, you know, the next time you're on the flight, they're going to talk about these masks that may drop down, put yours on before you try to help anyone else. You have to stay alive. Otherwise there's, you know, you can't help any, anyone else. So, so if from, if we kind of frame that in a neuroscience way, we go, our, our client's brain is saying, what's in it for me? Yeah. And so the idea of ego versus empathy is that when we start a conversation, whatever that means, if it's a conversation between you and me or someone landing on your website or you're pitching a project to a municipality um, or you're trying to win a new new client, whatever that conversation is, if we start it from a point of ego, meaning – this is who we are. This is our experience. These are our qualifications. Um, this is this is what we think matters. And and I don't and I want to be careful to say that I don't mean egomaniacal, right? I don't mean egotistical. I just mean from our own worldview, from our own point of view. This is what's important. Yeah. When we start the conversation from a point of ego, we start in direct conflict with their brain. But if we start from a point of empathy, what matters to them, what their biggest uh, threats are, their biggest fears are, when we start the conversation from that point, we start in alignment with their brain. And so whether we're talking about a website where someone's going to give you eight to 15 seconds before they decide they're either going to move on or they want to know more, or, um, you know, when I'm working with clients and we're working on a, uh, on a, uh, say a short list interview, a a pitch, I say, you've got three minutes. You're going to win. If they've given you an hour for this interview, you're going to win or lose in the first three minutes. Whatever the context is, you have a very, very short amount of time in order to, to quote unquote win. And if you start out in conflict with your, with their brains, what do you think is going to happen? Right. You have very little chance of winning, but if you start out in alignment with their brain, then you may be able to carry them on through the conversation and through the story and and help them understand why whatever it is that you're proposing is what they need. Um, And and so that that idea of of ego versus empathy is, I I think, one of the most important ideas 
in the world of architecture. Um, it's, and, and I don't want to throw architects under the bus. I mean, it's completely understandable when anyone in professional services starts from a point of ego. Yeah. Um, because y- you are the bona fide professionals, yeah. right? You have licenses and degrees and expertise and all those things, but we need to put those things aside, start from a point of empathy and even understand that we need to speak their language. We need to speak our client's language. When we use the, the jargon and the lingo of architecture, we really do ourselves a disservice. Many, many architects say, well, in order to, I, I, this, this isn't going to sound good, I know, but in order to project an air of professionalism, I need to hold up this language and, and, and this way of speaking and this way of presenting. And yes, you do need to be professional. Absolutely. Yeah. However, you can't walk into a room to a bunch of Italians and speak Japanese. It doesn't work, right? We have to be able to speak our client's language. And no matter what we wear, no matter how we carry ourselves, no matter what we say, if we're not speaking their language, and especially starting at a point of empathy, we're going to have a real problem. It's such a simple point but actually very very profound and can really change the way that you think about presenting yourself entirely i mean i i was speaking to a marketeer recently who works with a lot of architects and she was saying how even going to a you know like on a residential project even going to a residential client with your portfolio of other people's houses you have to recognize you're showing your potential client other people's houses they're interested right. in their house, what their right. house is going to look like. And and I've heard architects before who've told me stories of they've gone to clients with their portfolio and then the clients kind of shied away and said something like, you know, uh, maybe it's a bit too adventurous for us right now. We're not sure. Right. And then they've gone with another architect who's, you know, quite progressive. Uh, and then they've been sort of, oh, why did, why did that happen? And it's very much what you're saying here is this... Uh, not leading with with empathy and how right. how powerful that that is does that yeah. does that mean um if you're leading with empathy that you do f- that you forget about your your architectural agenda how do we how do we marry the two yeah yeah not at all but i think m- maybe one way to talk about it is to take the idea of storytelling right right if we if we tell someone the next the next time we're able to go to a networking event or <laughs> um, you know go go to a meeting or something like that, when you run into someone that spends the whole time talking about themselves, what happens? Right, your brain shuts down, and you go, "How do I get out of this conversation as quickly as possible?" Right, and so change the context of that slightly Mm. and say the next time that you go and meet with a potential client, if you spend the whole time talking about yourself and your firm and showing them your portfolio, what are you doing? You're doing the exact same thing as that person at the networking event. And so the most powerful way to use storytelling, which is what a lot of these great brands do is they use storytelling in everything that they do the most powerful thing you can do in terms of storytelling is craft a story that you're inviting your client to imagine they're a part of. And so um, many people in in the world of storytelling will talk about the hero's journey. Mm. It's the basis of, of every movie, every book that, you know, it's all based on the, on the hero's journey, almost all of it. You can't be the hero of your own story. If you want that story to be memorable, if you want that story to resonate with your client, you can't be the hero of the story. They have to be the hero. And so you're crafting the story and you're inviting the client to take part in it. So you're talking about designing a home 
and imagining if if this were if this were the the place where your family came home to at the end of the day or I guess in a, a little dark humor, imagine your your family were quarantined in this home for sixty days um, next year. You you need to craft a story that your potential client looks at and goes, "Yes, I can see myself being in that story. I can see myself as that character of that story." You get to play the the role of the guide or the mentor. And if you think about professional services, that's exactly what a professional service provider does. That's exactly what an architect does. Yes, we're designing. Yes, we're solving problems. But we're here in support of and we're here to help our client realize some sort of success in the future, you know, down the road, whether it's their home or their business or, or you know, the place that they worship or whatever. Um, and, and so it's... I, I think that's that's the real lesson is remember mm. you are a professional services provider. So play that role in the story. Play the role of the guide instead of trying to play the role of the hero. That's again again a, a real profound difference. I love the way that you've you've used that. I've come across the hero's journey quite a number of times, but actually never heard it put so succinctly as that, that it's the client that's the hero. And Absolutely. That's, that's very and so building a successful brand of making the client uh, become the hero, and you can see that that's much more of an emotional response as well. So when a client sort of thinks about your brand, they're going to get that feeling of trust or that feeling of security or that feeling of whatever good emotional response that you're kind of looking for, as opposed yeah. to. And and when. You- it's interesting that you bring up and important that you bring up emotion because number one, buying decisions are made based on emotion Mm. and the value that someone sees in a product or service is based on emotion. So we we make a decision in the limbic part of our brain based on emotion. And then we spend the rest of the time using our neocortex justifying or rationalizing that, that decision. And so when we look at w- when an architect complains that we're not being valued, that's because they're not appealing to the emotional part of the brain. They're trying to appeal to the neocortex, to the, the logical part of the brain by talking about uh, qualifications and, and things like that. No one has ever said, oh, wow, they're really, really qualified. Let's pay them more. What happens is your clients go, oh, here's three architects and they're all the same. Let's figure out which one feels like the best fit. Yes. And so the value that people see in any product or service is driven by their emotions. So the more that you can, and I'm not talking about trying to play, get, play you know, mind games with people or, or you know, manipulate people on an emotional level, but the more value they see or, or more emotional attachment they have to the story that you're inviting them into, the more value they see in that. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it's, there, there's, uh, there's an excellent resource. Every architect should read the book, uh, building a story brand by Donald Miller. And one of my favorite quotes from Donald Miller, and, and I like using this, because a lot of architects will say, well, you know, doctors are so well respected and so highly paid and, and, and compensated for what they do. And they complain because, well, you know, why aren't we valued like doctors? Because we're still in charge of, uh, or, or charged with protecting health, safety, and welfare and, and designing these healthy spaces and things like that. Why aren't we valued like doctors? It's because we don't act like doctors. Mm. Um, so my, my favorite quote from Donald Miller is you have to sell medicine to your client's pain. And so what we're trying to do as architects, as architects that are marketing our services as selling our services is we have to be selling medicine to our client's pain. We have to be selling solutions to their problems. Yeah. Um, and and that's that's really the key to getting to that that value 
Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Who in the architectural world, we spoke a little bit about um, Bjark Engels earlier, and you said you said you thought it was very interesting how he'd appointed somebody outside of the industry to kind of uh, come in and run the run the organisation or run various parts of the of his business. Whereas most architecture practices, we end up, you know, using other architects and people kind of graduate into it. What what firms do you think are doing a very good job of building brands architecturally? Architectural firms. Yeah, well, I I think you know to the to the point of big, um, it, it did fascinate me when he brought Sheila in, and and I, I believe first started she started as CFO and now is has moved on to maybe COO or CEO. But um, I thought that was a fascinating move because mm-hmm. it is it's looking outside of the industry to someone who has proven that they can they can direct the not only the finances but the operations and so on and so forth of businesses outside of the industry it very successfully so why not bring that kind of success into an architecture firm it's yeah. kind of a novel idea right um i think i i still think for anybody out there that wants to look at the profession of architecture, you know, sort of look inside the profession, look at Gensler, um, the art Gensler's book. And I don't remember how long it's been since he wrote it, but it's, it's arts principles. I think is the, is the title. I would guarantee that 99.9% of architects have never read arts principles. And you really, really need to read arts principles because most of the arguments that I hear, most of the pushback I get from firm leaders that want to resist lessons from the outside will be answered in that book. Um, Every once in a while I'll I'll pull a quote out of it and, and, and post it on LinkedIn or something like that because, you know, here's, here's this guy that, that started this firm, decades and decades and decades ago, who's got this book that's still completely applicable, uh, probably more so today than, than when he, when he wrote it, you know, he's almost sort of a maverick at the time. Mm. But, uh, but I, I think, I think there are a few, a few out there. And I think, I, I think those that will continue to make a mark in the profession are ones that are thinking outside of the profession, that are looking outside of the profession. Um, I, I have a lot of hope for this new generation of leaders that's, that's coming out of school and coming into firms now because many of these young people are not wired to think inside the box of the profession. You know, they're, they're looking all over the place. They you know, they've grown up with social media and all those things that some people look at that as a negative. I think that's, I think that's a huge positive. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, you know, if we want to call them millennials, um, I'm not big on the, on the labels, but if we, if we want to call them millennials, if, if a stereotype of a millennial is someone that wants to belong to something that's bigger than them, that wants to connect with, with something that has a purpose that's larger than themselves, that's not a negative. If we look at the biggest brand, the best brands in the world, that's exactly what those brands are doing. Yeah. They're creating something that's bigger than themselves. So I have a lot of hope for people um, that have that point of view and are even looking at the profession in terms of redefining the value proposition and the offerings. I love that. And that, that's really inspiring when we start thinking beyond the kind of regular confines of what architecture is and how we can serve outside. When you said earlier about you often meet resistance from lessons from the outside. What what sort of resistance when you say what do you mean when you say that? Well, number one, change is hard for people. Yeah. Right. And and you said it just a, a minute ago is that most of our leaders no matter what position they are in the firm, were grown up. You know, here's an architect that, <laughs> to, to get a little bit stereotypical about it, hey, this, this, 
woman is really good with these spreadsheets. Why don't we make her in charge of our accounting? You know, I, sorry if that offends anyone, but that's a pretty typical conversation, right? Or here's this guy that, that, uh, you know, is, is good at this. Let's put him in charge of, of this. No training, you know, no background for it, but we, the, and I've done, you know, to be honest, I've done that through my career, right? I said at the beginning, other people hijacked my career. Um, we grow people into these positions that they they have no real training for. Mm. And, and the only thing that many of them know is this profession that we're in, you know, yeah. coming full circle on the conversation. Mm. We're always looking inside the profession. We design websites for other architects to look at, right? Rather than design websites that are really meant to convert um, potential clients or attract potential clients. And so anytime you go into a conversation and say, this is the way another industry does it, or this is the way another profession does it, you're likely to run into resistance. Well, yeah, well, that, that won't work in our profession. And here's why. Uh, two weeks ago, I was sitting with a friend of mine who's, a, who's an IT consultant that works for a lot of architecture and engineering firms right at the very beginning of, of COVID-19 becoming a thing, you know, in the United States. And he said, I was having a conversation with the firm leader. So this would have been maybe three weeks ago. I was having a conversation with the firm leader and he said, well, we can't work remotely because our work is so collaborative that we couldn't possibly you know, be in, in remote places. And I said, that's a firm leader that's, that's not really being honest with themselves. Yeah. That's not really being, uh, and, and I don't mean that in, you know, there, there's anything um, sinister about that. Yeah. I just think that if I put cameras throughout your office and we, we videotaped and, and we determined what amount of time people actually sat face to face to collaborate, I think we would have a very different discussion about how we collaborate, how we collaborate and whether or not we could work remotely. And ironically, you know, two weeks on or three weeks on, most people are working remotely now, right? So um, there, there's this resistance to change and, and, you know, this human nature, this is the way we've always done it. Yeah. That doesn't mean it's the best way. It doesn't even mean it's a good way. It just <laughs> means that's the way that we've always done it. Brilliant. Jeff, uh, that was absolutely fascinating. And I'm, I'm really looking for, has the, the Build Your Brand podcast it's already begun? It's, it's launched uh, this week, uh, tomorrow, I believe. So today's March 30th. Uh, tomorrow, I believe, uh, episode three will, will drop. Um, the whole the whole season is in the can, as they say, but it's uh, it comes out every week on Tuesdays, and uh, you can find it wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Perfect. Well, I shall certainly be tuning in, and I'll I'll put a link in the uh, information for this for this I appreciate uh, podcast. That. Thank you. Brilliant, Jeff. Thank you so much for your time this morning, and uh, hopefully, I get to meet you in person one day. Well, one of these days when we can travel again, <laughs> we'll, we'll have to do that. I appreciate you uh, having me on here and, and having a great conversation, Ryan. Thank you. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.